The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. This evening, the DuPont Cavalcade presents the story of the coming of the Swedish colonists to America. After landing on these shores 300 years ago this spring in 1638, the Swedes built Fort Christina on the site of the present city of Wilmington, Delaware. This evening's performance is being broadcast by shortwave to the steamer Kungsholm at sea, where the Crown Prince of Sweden and his party are en route to attend the Swedish tercentenary celebration in America. About 200 years ago, about 200 years rather after the Swedes came to America, there was born in Sweden a man who later became a world-famous chemist, Alfred Bernhard Nobel. His studies resulted in the discovery of that remarkably useful explosive dynamite. Our story of chemistry tonight concerns dynamite's part in securing a rare mineral, one that was known for many years simply as element number 42. Did you ever hear about the Japanese sword maker 600 years ago, whose accidental discovery now enables steel mills to produce steel that doesn't get tired? Listen at the close of our broadcast for this tale, which illustrates once more how DuPont research chemists are helping to provide better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> Tonight's dramatization is based partly on material supplied by Kathleen Paul, whose current novel, Mural for a Later Day, has its historical setting among the early Swedish colonists in America. As an overture, Don Voorhees and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra play a special setting of Victor Herbert's ever popular waltz, Kiss Me Again. <laughs>
Belmont Cavalcade moves forward. On the 28th of August, 1609, Henry Hudson, from the deck of his ship, the Half Moon, was the first white man to gaze on the shores of the state of Delaware. The following year, an English navigator, Captain Samuel Argall, sighted the Cape and Promontory and named the region in honor of Thomas de la Warre, first colonial governor of Virginia. Then came the English colonists to settle at Jamestown and Plymouth Rock, the Dutch to follow at New Amsterdam. It is spring in the year 1638 at Fort Nassau, a trading post of the Dutch West India Company on the upper shore of the Delaware. The commissary, Jan van Ilpendam, is sitting with his advisors at a table beneath a towering tree. And the governor ends his letter this way. It is your responsibility to strengthen our possessions along the river. Signed, Chief, New Amsterdam. Yeah, mm, yeah, you've yeah. been receiving many dispatches from him lately, Jan. Yeah. yeah. And all of the same tone, Masters. Can it be he's worried about Fort Nassau? Well, he has no right to be. The Dutch farmers are happy. Trading is excellent. Uh, hand me that quill and the parchment. Yeah. I'll reassure him again. Masters! Huh? Masters! Yeah. Oh, Captain Van Orman seems excited. Masters! My men have sighted the ship in the bay. Flying the flag of Sweden. What? Are you sure? That sounds impossible. Aye. It's a Swedish ship, Master. Oh, there's been some talk in New Amsterdam of a Swedish company. But how dare they invade Dutch territory? What kind of fools have I got around me that such a ship could enter the bay without being stopped? But, Master... Rouse the guard. We'll drive them off Netherlands territory. Oh, commissary, that might be unwise. How do we know Sweden hasn't made some agreement with the Dutch West India Company? And if we go charging down to the shore to drive the Swedes away, we might blunder into an embarrassing position. Uh, I'll ask Kieft. Maybe they know something about this in New Amsterdam. <laughs> and I, I was going to reassure the governor. Well, so be it. We'll wait for his orders. <laughs> In the meantime, Governor Keith had learned from the directors of the Dutch West India Company that a company of Swedish colonists had been dispatched to the New World. In charge of the venture was Peter Minuit, who had formerly been a director of the Dutch West India Company at Fort Amsterdam, on what is now Manhattan Island, New York. Governor Keith dispatched a sharp note protesting the Swedish action in care of his commissary at Fort Nassau. On receiving it, Van Ilpendam, his counselor and fleet, and their escort hastened to the spot where the Swedes have nailed their coat of arms to a tree and are now surrounding two newly erected blockhouses with palisades. We're looking for Peter Minowitz. Yes? Why, why, Van Fleet, my friend. Oh, I haven't seen you since you were governor of New Amsterdam, Minowitz. Uh. We come as representatives of the Dutch West India Company. This is the commissary at Fort Nassau, Jan van Ilpendam. Oh. You must meet my commissary and my commander. Uh, Huygen! Yes? Uh, Kling! Put down your axes and come here. You plan to settle on these premises? You see for yourself. Every man is busy building Port Christina. You called us Minuit? Uh, yes, Huygen. Uh, these gentlemen are representatives of the Dutch West India Company. And I know they have something to say. I want you both to hear. I will come to the point at once. Here. Read this dispatch from Governor Kieft of New Amsterdam, if you please. From the governor of New Amsterdam. Hmm. Uh, we do hereby protest against all damages, expenses, and losses, together with all mishaps, bloodshed, and disturbances, which may arise in future time therefrom, and that we shall maintain our jurisdiction in such manner as we shall deem most expedient. <laughs> well, the governor has a right to protest. Uh, Huygen. Yes? Give me our treaty with the chief. Certainly. Here. Uh, thank you. Listen, master. To the Swedish company, lawful control of all the land between Minquist Kill and Bombay Hook, as well as the territory from Minquist Kill to the school kill. And there are their five totem marks. 
We made that treaty as soon as we anchored the Kalamar Nickel. The Netherlands won't recognize an Indian treaty. Don't try to make me believe that. I made the one which gave the Netherlands New Amsterdam while you were still a counting house clerk in The Hague. They recognized that treaty. To be consistent, they'll have to recognize this. Tell that to Governor Keith. If you think I'm going to one, come. It'll be wiser if we return to Fort Nassau for the present. You show good judgment, Van Vliet. We can all trade peacefully. Even now, our other ship, the Fogelgrip, has gone to Jamestown to trade with the English. Don't be too optimistic, Minuit. You haven't seen the last of us yet. Give the order to Mark. Company, march! Yeah. Did you hear that, Peter? Yeah. Does that mean trouble with the Dutch? I don't know. But we're here, and we're going to stay here. But with the completion of Fort Christina... Discouraging news beset the little colony as the Fogel Grip returned from Jamestown. Michael Simonson, its mate, reported that the English had refused to recognize New Sweden and would not trade. At this, Peter Minuit resolved to return to Sweden for much-needed supplies, only to perish in a storm off St. Kitts in the West Indies. Then the Swedish government dispatched a second expedition, including a group from Finland to the New World in 1639. The new governor, Peter Ritter, mismanaged the affairs of the colony. And one day in 1643, he sits gloomily talking with Hendrik Huygens in his cabin at Fort Christina. Would it not be wise for you to greet the two ships which have just anchored Governor Ritter? Minuit would have. Let these new colonists come to see me. I'm the governor. Mm. I can see the ships out this window. It's what? The farmer. Beautiful boat. Has everybody landed yet? Mm, most of them. Some are coming up to the fort. One of them's a giant. Tallest man I've ever seen. Hey, more mouths to feed. There isn't enough here for the colonists as it is. Hey, you'll just have to authorize my making drastic reductions in the allotments, Governor Ridder. Detail, detail. I don't want to be bothered with it. Can't you attend to it yourself? Very well. Come in. And by the table of war, the least I expect is that someone here see that my furniture and my woman folks' belongings are properly looked after. Good day to you, gentlemen. Good day, sir. Welcome to Fort Christina, sir. This is Governor Ritter. Indeed. Well, sir, I've been hearing your colonists complain, and rightly so. No fine inns, only poor hovels to live in. A wretched place by my life, this new Sweden. But I am to relieve you as governor, sir. My name is Johann Prince. Uh, that's good news. You'll get no protest from me. Uh, my appointment. To our beloved subject, the noble and well-born... Uh, uh, here, you read it. <laughs> Too many nice things for me to say about myself. Uh, Johann Prince. Lieutenant Colonel of the West Gothic Cavalry, ennobled by us, and now appointed governor of the considerable tract of land known as New Sweden. Well, my best wishes, Governor Prince. Have you any orders? My wife and family must be housed as befits their station. We have no elegance here. You see, for yourselves, we live in a wilderness. Wilderness? Nonsense! You men have everything here, but you do nothing. You don't understand. We're merely traders. Never mind. All will be changed. This should be good farm country. We must have fine homes and beautiful farms. I'll see to that. But first, let us go straight to the church. We must offer thanksgiving for our safe voyage. We have no church, Governor. No church? Intolerable. One must be built. Mr. Campanius. Mr. Campanius! I, I am here, Master Prince. Gather our flock. We will have to sing our hymn of gratitude... Here in the blockhouse. I shall give the note. And mind you, let all sing. Almighty fortress is our God.
From 1643 to 1653, Johann Prince's commanding presence and inflexible will brought confidence to New Sweden. Under his administration as governor, the colony achieved its highest peak. The governor's home, Princehof, was the most magnificent house between New England and Virginia. One afternoon, Governor Prince and his wife are talking with the Reverend Johann Campanius and a distinguished Dutch explorer, David de Vries, at Prince Hope. Will you have some more wine, Master de Vries? A little, please. Ah, thank you, Mrs. Prince. My wife makes it herself. Well, that accounts for its fine flavor. <laughs> Tell me, Mistress Prince, which do you prefer? The new Sweden or the old Sweden? Neither, Master de Vries. God's yes. fifteen, wife. What do you mean by that? Please, your hand. Your all. Huh? Oh, well, well, come, come. Speak up, speak up. Oh, it's just that sometimes, your hand, I think we use the word Sweden too much when it no matter, no longer matters, really. Mm. The old world, all that, we've left behind us. We're in a new land now, and we have new lives to make. Mistress Prince is right. The point is well taken. Like the wine in our glasses, Master de Vries. We made it, and we enjoy it. That's how we feel about our colony. Why, I'm proud of my husband. <laughs> Everyone along these shores knows about the governor's work. I've tried to do the best I could. Look out of that window, Master de Vries. You see a great and beautiful country. You see homes, farmlands, boats on the rivers and rich timber in the forests. We have every reason to be happy, leaving this heritage to coming generations. Yes? What is it, Hilda? Master Huygen, see the governor. Have him come in, by all means. This way, master. Thank you. Governor, I have important news. Well, oh, well, well, the indomitable Huygen. Yeah, the news can wait. Now you must meet Master de Vries. Hendrik Huygen is my most trusted counselor. How do you do, Master Huygen? You are David de Vries, the Dutch explorer? Yes. I'm glad to know you. Thank you. Governor, may I have your ear privately a moment? What? Why? What reason is there? It's urgent, Governor. And necessary. Oh, very well. Look after our guests, my dear. Of course. You'll excuse me. Certainly, Governor Prince. Now then, Hagen, what is it? One of my men was hunting two days ago in a forest. He saw Dutch troops building a fort down the river right here in our colony. I couldn't tell you in front of the fleece. By the table of war, man! Is this true? I fear it is, Governor. How many Dutch soldiers did your man see, Hagen? Not many. He was driven away by one of the sentries. They're calling it Fort Casimir. Hmm. We could easily capture it, Governor. Else it will split our colony. We'll be isolated from our key fort at Elfsborg. Such a victory would be short-lived, Hagen. Remember this. We've got to be diplomatic with the Dutch always. They'd overwhelm us if they sent an army down here to retaliate. Then what will we do, Governor? Let them have their Fort Casimir. Much good it will do them. If we seize it, we'll only bring about a war. We need more men. I know, Governor. Much as I hate to leave, I must. I am going back to Sweden for help. However, on Johann Prince's return to Sweden, the Swedish government decided to replace him with a new governor, Johann Riesing. Immediately on his arrival, Riesing disregarded Huygens' advice and easily captured Fort Casimir, which he rechristened Fort Trinity. In New Amsterdam, Peter Stuyvesant vehemently protested. For the following two years, Johann Riesing strove to strengthen the stature of the colony in a land seething with trouble. One stormy evening, he is sitting with his counselor, the aging Huygen, in his two-story mansion on the banks of the Brandywine River. The storm is just about over now. Yeah, I think I'd better go home, then. Oh, I didn't mean it that way, Huygen. I see little enough of you as it is. Uh, I'm kept busy riding up and down the colony, so I can report to you how our plantations are progressing. Uh, you save me much worry. I am worried about the Dutch, though. Our messengers from New Amsterdam say they are drilling their troops from morning until night. Uh, Peter Stuyvesant, 
We'll never forgive you for taking Fort Casimir. Yeah. I didn't realize the implications at the time. I won't refuse your advice so readily after this, Huygens. I've been in New Sweden from the very beginning, Governor. I helped build Fort Christina. I've served under every governor. That's why I feel I should be able to advise you. Thank you, Huygen. I appreciate your experience. Yes? Governor, there's an Indian out here. He brings news. Yes, Johnson. Come in, come in. He's complaining. He's complaining about the soldiers taking corn from the Indians. What soldiers? I gave strict orders. Dutch soldiers, Governor. Dutch soldiers. I think they're on the way to Fort Christina. Says they recaptured Fort Trinity already. Uh, and Stuyvesant sailed here with his army, just as I feared. Lieutenant Jansen, muster our troops. We'll march to Fort Christina tonight. As the morning mists curled over the Delaware River, the Swedish soldiers manned every loophole in Fort Christina, waiting. Governor Riesing, Henrik Huygen, and Lieutenant Janssen stand near the stockade gate as Governor Peter Stuyvesant and his escort enter the fort under a flag of truce. Let's not mince words, gentlemen. I come in the name of the Netherlands to annex this territory to our kingdom. I demand your unconditional surrender, Governor Riesing. And if I refuse, Governor Stuyvesant... You should know our reply. Fire and the sword. Your fort can't stand against my ships. However, I will grant this. The Swedish people who remain will be allowed to retain their civil and religious liberty. That's your last word? Unless you choose to hear a Dutch cannonade. Very well, Governor Stuyvesant. Then I advise you to leave the fort while we're still under a flag of truce. Talk it over with your men. I'll give you one half hour. If my terms are acceptable, order your drummer to sound the drum roll and have your soldiers march out of Fort Christina. That will be a sign of your surrender. Remember, I offer peace and civil liberties under the Dutch flag. I never go back on my word. We will discuss it, Governor Stuyvesant. You have the power to force a war or to maintain peace. Captain, we march. Forward. Lieutenant. Shut the gate behind him. At once, Governor. I'll have the sergeant pull down that white flag. It was a mistake to raise it. He said we'd have civil and religious liberty under Dutch rule. Now, what if he did? That means we could go about our lives in peace. You'd better not stay here when we open fire, Governor. Blockhouse is safer. This is a crisis, Governor Riesing. Think before you plunge us into war. This is no time for thought. It's time for action. We'll all suffer if we go to war. We can't submit to Stuyvesant. Resistance is futile. Minuit, Ridder, Prince, they all realized it. You would have a new flag over our colony. The flag is nothing. It's ourselves that matter. We have a chance to build a great civilization here at Fort Christina. In peace. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. We can't progress if we keep up this enmity with the Dutch. We came to America to make progress. Very well. Lieutenant, assemble your soldiers to march out of the fort. Order the drum roll. Yes, Governor. You know, Huygen, I don't feel that this is the end. We've done too much to give it all up and return to Sweden. We may have to fly the flag of the Netherlands, but it's really the spirit of the Swedish people we'll be raising to the American skies. These Swedish colonists contributed to the rise of the state of Delaware, first under their own sovereignty later under the flag of the Netherlands, then England, and finally our own United States. Swedish resourcefulness and effort formed a contributing chapter in the development of American character. Sweden was the first world power to recognize our newly born republic after the War of Independence. 
This evening, DuPont salutes the Swedish people who have come to this country and have contributed to its greatness in the cavalcade of America. You've heard the expression, as tough as steel. But did you know that steel gets tired? Just as human beings take a tonic to avoid that tired feeling, so do modern steel and iron get a dose of medicine that builds up strength against what the experts call fatigue. One of the products used for this purpose is called molybdenum. It makes steel tough, and it's a tough name to pronounce, but since even the people who mine molybdenum call it molly, that's what we'll call it from now on. More than six centuries ago, there lived a Japanese sword maker named Masamune, who made such fine swords they were noted for centuries. What really brought Masamune's swords their fame was the tough quality of their steel. Six hundred years later, a chemist, analyzed one of these marvelous old swords and found that the steel had molly in it. Almost up to the beginning of our own century, molly was regarded simply as element number 42, a rare, practically unknown metal. Widespread use of it didn't begin until about 20 years ago, not long after the greatest molly deposit in the world was discovered in Colorado. Bartlett Mountain in the heart of the Rockies is almost a solid mass of this valuable ore. The metal itself is distributed in very small amounts throughout solid granite rock. And the only way of getting it out is to pulverize the granite in the mountain. And that's where the DuPont chemist comes in. Because the chemical product dynamite is the only practical tool to use in obtaining the ore. About once each month, a great chunk of the mountain is blasted into pieces which are carted away and crushed up in the mill nearby. A few years ago, more than 110,000 pounds of dynamite were set off in a single blast. This dislodged some 750,000 tons of ore, said to be the greatest underground shot ever set off in this country. Just imagine a mass of rock the size of a 20-story building, one block square, supported underneath by 90 solid rock pillars. All these pillars were loaded with DuPont dynamite. Then the switch was pushed, and the mountainside crumbled into bits. That's how chemistry starts molly on its way to serve you. As, for instance, in the durable, lightweight steel that goes into your automobile. Alloys containing molly combine great strength with lightness. They're tougher and have greater wear resistance. The DuPont company itself uses molly in a unique process for bright zinc plating, which DuPont chemists developed as a big step forward in protecting metal objects. The story of Molly adds up to another apt illustration of the DuPont pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. We've received many letters asking why in our stories of American pioneers we've not dramatized the life of the founder of the DuPont company. So next week we will present the story of Eleuther Irene DuPont, founder of the company which now bears his name, as the concluding broadcast in this present series of the Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.